Okay, I think we'll make a start. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Michaels, and I'm the IEN Senior Fellow at eBay. I'd like to welcome all of you to eBay's seminar series on U.S. foreign policy. And for those of you who previously attended prior to the summer, welcome back. The series is part of a joint initiative of eBay and the Barcelona Institute of North American Studies that aims to promote discussion of U.S. foreign policy related topics by inviting both scholars and practitioners to share both their research and provide their insights. This academic term, so essentially now through mid-December, we will address a wide variety of issues related to the past, present, and future of American foreign policy, including human rights policy, the evolution of American studies in Europe, the continuity versus change from the Trump presidency to the Biden presidency, uh, an assessment of where we are today with the Biden administration and where it's likely to go prior to the next election, and the role of international status as a driving force of American policy. Although all these events are online, we'll also be holding an in-person event on the 16th of November with the Foreign Minister of Catalonia, speaking about Catalonia's relations with the United States. This evening, we'll be focusing on the evolution of the U.S. position towards the crime of aggression and its implications for America's uh, quite controversial relationship with the International Criminal Court. And it gives me tremendous pleasure to welcome Dr. Julia Pecorella to the seminar series. Now, I think I, I found that one of the great things about Twitter is that you come across all sorts of announcements that you wouldn't otherwise come across. And some months ago, I saw the advertisement for Dr. Pecorella's uh, recently published book, The United States of America and the Crime of Aggression. And as soon as I saw that, I made a note to myself that I needed to invite Dr. Pecorella to speak here because it, it's a topic that I've been intrigued by for some time now not just in relation to the, uh, the Kellogg-Briand Pact, which was the main theme of the, um, uh, of the best-selling book, The Internationalist by Una Hathaway and Scott Shapiro, but also when you think about the Nuremberg and the Tokyo trials after World War II, where the crime of aggression featured prominently, as well as more recently with the 1998 uh, Rome Statute setting up the International Criminal Court, uh, the US opposition to the ICC, uh, the Kampala Conference in 2010, and then the agreement in late 2017 to allow the ICC to prosecute crimes of aggression. And of course, as we've seen with a number of wars the U.S. has been involved with since the Second World War, the question of whether or not it has engaged in aggressive war has repeatedly arisen and evoked a great deal of political controversy. And I, I think it's fair to say uh, it has provoked a great deal of diplomatic and legal maneuvering on the part of the U.S. government across many different administrations, both Democrat and Republican. Uh, just to give a bit of background about tonight's speaker, uh, she received her PhD from Middlesex University in 2014 on the topic of the United States and the crime of aggression. I think essentially going back to the uh, um, US uh, Declaration of Independence or uh, roughly around that period of time, as a quarter ways back. Uh, being quite loyal to Middlesex University, Dr. Pecorella has remained there ever since where she's now senior lecturer in law. She has published various journal articles and book chapters on international law issues, and has also co-authored with uh, Professor William Shabazz, uh, another book uh, on international courts and human rights uh, that will be coming out next year. Uh, so Dr. Pecorella, welcome to eBay, uh, virtually at least, and I very much look forward to your presentation. Uh, mm -hmm. The floor is yours, and your presentation should be coming up any second now. Right. Thank you, Jeff. So good evening, everyone. It's a real pleasure for me to inaugurate the um, new um, seminar series on U.S. foreign policies organized by the Institute. Thanks. Uh, many thanks to Jeffrey. I agree t Twitter can actually um, be a great thing when it comes to make new collections and also somehow uh, get in touch with uh, very interesting uh, colleagues uh, abroad as well. Um, if um, And so thank you very much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure for me. The topic of our seminars today, as you just uh, mentioned, would be um, basically would focus on the US, the International Criminal Court and the crime of aggression. So I thought I needed to provide you with to introduce you basically with the, the the idea of the International Criminal Court as such, because you might not be familiar with this institution. Um, 
The International Criminal Court is the first permanent international criminal court established by, by a treaty signed in Rome in, in 1998. Um, it sits in The Hague and has got jurisdiction over genocide, crimes against humanity, war crime and the crime of aggression. And um, very peculiarly, um, it can, the court can have jurisdiction over crimes allegedly committed uh, by national or state parties or um, within the territory of a state party. That means that um, potentially uh, some crimes committed by national or states that are not parties to their own state establishing the court could actually um, be uh, the object of a proceeding before the court. And this is quite relevant for our discussion today because, um, as you might be aware of, the United States of America is not a party to the Rome Statute. Um, you might have heard, let me see, yes, of the hostility of the US administration under President Trump towards the court. Um, just a way of uh, to, to provide you an example. Back in September 28, the then um, National Security Advisor John Bolton publicly threatened the court with the adoption of sanctions. And uh, these sanctions became a reality in September 2020 when the Secretary of State, the then Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo, actually announced that the, the ICC prosecutor Fatou Ben Souda and the head of the of jurisdiction, complementarity and cooperation division of the court were targeted with uh, economic sanctions. And this pushed one to an executive order that had been signed by Trump um, in June the same year, declaring a national emergency with respect to the International Criminal Court. You might be aware that um, on the 1st of, of April, okay, President Trump, uh, President Biden actually terminated the, this uh, um, emergency and therefore he terminated also the economic sanctions targeting the ICC personnel together with other measures taken under Trump, such as visa restrictions and so on. Still, um, my main point, what I wanted to do today is to look at the main reasons the Trump administration, behind the Trump administration um, hostility towards the court and see whether some of them might still be relevant for the current administration or for the for future administration as well. So I divided the reason behind such an hostile approach towards the court in three. Uh, the first group, uh, I call them distinctive reasons, and because I consider that these are basically due to the policy of under the US uh, uh, President Trump administration. And uh, so I believe that the economic sanctions uh, against the ICC personnel could be seen within a broader context of a general idiosyncrasy towards international organization and multilateralism that really uh, very much characterized the Trump administration. Other example of the same approach could be the denunciation of the Paris Agreement and um, of course the announcement of uh, the withdrawal from the World Health Organization under Trump. Both of these examples, um, by the way, have been retracted by President Trump, one, uh, President Biden once uh, in office. So these are reasons that might be relevant and basically only for President Trump administration, might not be relevant anymore for the current or future presidents of the United States. Um, the second group of reasons behind these uh, hostility toward the, the court, uh, I call them circumstantial reasons because I believe that these were due to specific circumstances and events that occurred over the years of the Trump administration. Yet these um, events and uh, circumstances could still be relevant for President Biden. Um, and I'm referring in particular to the ICC recent practice uh, with respect to two situation. Um, the first one is the situation in Afghanistan. 
Back in March 2020, so under President Trump, um, the Appeals Chamber of the ICC has authorized the <clears throat> prosecutor to commence an investigation into the alleged crimes committed um, basically in connection with the armed conflict in Afghanistan. And therefore, these might have included uh, crimes committed by U.S. personnel in Afghanistan. Yet, um, I must add that very recently, last month, the new uh, ICC prosecutor, Karim Khan, has uh, filed an application to seek an authorization to resume the investigation uh, re with respect to the Afghan situation before the ICC. Basically, the ICC um, is uh, based on a principle that is called the com complementarity principle. Therefore, the idea is that national jurisdiction of states, parties, or in any case, relevant national jurisdiction will um, uh, basically carry, it is assumed that they will carry out their proceedings uh, unless the ICC uh, established that um, the state authority, the state is unwilling or unable to proceed to carrying on this operation. So right after the authorization back in March 2020, the, the Afghan authorities at the time had um, decided to carry on their own national investigation with, within the context of the same situation and the ICC prosecutor gave the way to national authorities. Yet, um, following the advent of the Taliban more recently, the ICC prosecutor believed that there has been a fundamental changes in the circumstances and that the current uh, national authorities might not be uh, willing or uh, they might be unwilling or unable to actually carry on a genuine proceedings. Um, and therefore, it is now applying to resume the investigation before the ICC. What is relevant for the purposes of our discussion today is that um, he added in his announcement that uh, if the permission will be granted by the uh, pre-trial chamber too, then um, his intention is to focus on the crimes committed by the Taliban and the Islamic State of uh, the Khorasan province, province. So basically leaving aside possibly uh, possible crimes uh, committed by uh, US personnel. This announcement has been, as you might imagine, uh, welcomed by the Biden administration. But still, we must see how the, the pre-trial chamber uh, will decide, will pronounce itself. The second situation I'm referring uh, here today is the situation um, in relation to the um, state of Palestine. Um, in March 2021, the prosecutor has announced his in, her, in, her intention at the time to open an investigation um, with, with respect to crimes committed in the state of of Palestine. And uh, this was already undergoing basically during the years of the Trump administration, but as you might imagine, um, this is still particularly of a particular concern for the Biden, for the Biden administration. And you can tell that both situations are still of concern for Biden. If you look at the words of the president himself and the secretary of state on the occasion of the termination of sanctions by the court, you will see that uh, they mentioned uh, uh, openly that their concern regards the ICC jurisdiction over states, not parties, <clears throat> nationals of states, not parties, including the US and its allies like Israel. And they mentioned the situation in Afghanistan and Palestine. So basically, they admitted that the concern was exactly the same uh, that uh, the, the, the characterized the previous administration. What is different now is the strategy that they chose uh, in order to achieve the very same aim, that is um, basically uh, based nowadays in, um, in an engagement with all stakeholders instead of uh, through the adoption of sanctions, basically. And the last group of um, reasons I wanted to focus uh, today 
I call them intrinsic and I, because I believe that this regards uh, basically the very same nature of the subject involved. The US on the one hand with its history, with its um, constitutional culture, with its political and military interests, and on the other hand, an international criminal court that has been established with the very purposes of ending impunity with regards to crimes that are considered of concern of the international community as a whole. Um, because of the nature of these uh, two subjects, uh, basically it is understandable that the, the relationship, it has always been and probably will always be a difficult one. If you look back um, at the inception uh, of the year of the, the basically establishment of the court uh, with the um, adoption of the Rome Statute back in 1998, for instance, the US uh, on that occasion um, called for an unrecorded vote and was among the seven states voted ag voting against the statute. And um, the reason given for this uh, choice um, was were threefold basically. So you, um, they mentioned the fact that the statute of the ICC provides for an, an independent prosecutor and these, according to the US, will conflict with some uh, US constitutional provisions. The fact that um, although the, the statute recognized a central role to the UN Security Council, still uh, it granted a full and complete independence to the court. Um, and lastly, and most more importantly for the purposes of our discussion today, the US uh, in Rome decided to vote against the state because states um, at that time decided to include the crime of aggression among the crimes the court could have jurisdiction over. Mm. After Rome, President Clinton um, among, decided to sign the statute, but he never submitted it to the um, US Senate for uh, the, the traditional advice and consent needed for any international treaties to be ratified in the US. Um, and um, this uh, already difficult uh, relationship got worse with, under President Bush. Um, as he um, even, um, announced the, their willingness to unsign the state, a practice which is, of course, quite controversial under international law. And they also started up a practice um, in the basically years following the entry into force of the state uh, back in 2002, in, whereby they concluded bilateral agreements with um, huge number of states, uh, they were 80 by the end of 2004, uh, granting Im immunities to US personnel were on abroad, basically. This difficult relationship only found a moment of uh, uh, chilling uh, when in 2005, the Bush administration decided not to veto the UN Security Resol uh, Council resolution referring the situation in Darfur uh, to the ICC. Uh, but still, the US representatives decided not to attend any meetings of the Assembly of States parties uh, since 2002. And they only came back once President Obama was elected in November 20, 2009. Under Obama, there, there has been an improvement of such a relationship. For instance, the US voted in favor, not only abstained, but voted in favor of the UN Security Council resolution referring the situation in Libya to the ICC. And they were also in favor of a um, similar resolution back in 2014 referring the situation of Syria to the, um, the ICC that never was adopted because, of course, of the veto of Russia and China. Um, but still, even under President Obama, um, the possibilities of joining the Rome Statute was never under discussion, and they kept opposing the adoption of any definition of the crime of aggression. Yes, because as I said, uh, back in Rome, states decided to include the crime of aggression among the crimes the court could have jurisdiction, but they also added in the then paragraph 
two of Article 5, that the court could have uh, exercised jurisdiction over aggression only when states, uh, parties could have agreed on a definition of the crime and to be contained in an amendment to the state to be adopted uh, on the occasion of a review conference to be organized no sooner than seven years after the entry into force of the Rome Statute. And this is exactly what happened uh, back in 2010 in Kampala, uh, Uganda. The state parties organized the very first review conference of um, the statute and they, um, at the very last moment, agreed on a definition uh, which was adopted by consensus. So it's a very long and quite um, a complicated definition because, of course, it came as a result of many diplomatic compromises. What I wanted to fo you to focus on today is um, the fact that um, an act of aggression for the purposes of the crime of aggression, so for, the, for, for an act of aggression to be relevant for the individual criminal responsibility, so the criminal responsibilities of leaders of states um, when committing aggression, this must be by its character, gravity and scale, a manifest violation of the United Nations Charter. We will come to this um, a bit uh, towards the end of um, my presentation. And second point is uh, uh, the fact that paragraph two of uh, the new article 8b of the ICC statute made express reference to the UN General Assembly resolution adopted back in 1974 by consensus um, defining aggression. And they all uh, states also decided to copy and paste basically the non exhaustive list of um, acts that for sure constitute aggression according to the General Assembly resolution. Uh, which are basically contained in, the, in its Article 2. Um, what is um, interesting is that um, in Kampala, the US participated as observer state um, and they uh, opposed till the end to the, the possibility of adopting, uh, adopting such a definition. Among the reasons given for this uh, stance, um, there was the fact that they believed that such a definition could not be said to mirror customer international law. So as you might know, among the international law, you have treaties, <laughs> so written sources of law that are generally, generally binding only among states, parties, but then you also have unwritten laws, that is customer international law, and um, this is uh, binding uh, on all non on all states. So, of course, if a treaty provision could be said to mirror customer international law, this becomes of relevance not only for those states that have adhered to the, the statute, but to all states. So, the statute is uh, potentially, as any other treaty, but in particular for its nature uh, and the values uh, underpinning it, um, capable of uh, codifying, crystallizing, but also creates new customer international law rules when it comes to crimes um, of international concern. The US position in Kampala was that this definition could not mirror custom, customer international law because of the fact that states wanted to refer and made use of uh, the General Assembly resolution. Now, um, they said that basically in this way, the treaty provision contain, adopted in Kampala will detach from the customary definition of, uh, custom of um, the crime of aggression. And they were obviously referring to the precedent established uh, in Nuremberg. So, as you might know, in, during December 1945, uh, the main allies, decided, allied powers, decided to meet in London and negotiated and drafted and adopted a charter of an international military tribunal, uh, the one of Nuremberg. The um, peculiarity of the whole structure and architecture of Nuremberg is that um, um, aggression was quite central to it. Um, the, co the military tribunal could have jurisdiction of crimes against peace, namely the preparation planning, preparation, initiation, and execution of a war of aggression, and uh, um, war crimes and crimes against humanity, which were, of course, relevant only if committed um, in connection with the 
crime of aggression. So aggression was very much central. The whole structure in Nuremberg uh, reflected most of the U.S. position taken in London by the U.S. representatives, uh, Robert Jackson, and then before the tribunal by the U.S. prosecutor, always Robert Jackson. Um, and the tribunal embraced most of the um, arguments made by the U.S. prosecutor in its final judgment and the principle established in Nuremberg in, its, in Tokyo uh, right after and in, in the US before the US subsequent trials established right after the judgment, the final judgment came out, um, basically were reaffirmed by the UN General Assembly in one of the first resolution of the General Assembly back in 1946 and 47. These resolutions were very much uh, drafted and adopted under the initiative of the U.S. representative. So the U.S. gave a huge imprinting to the Nuremberg principles and they um, actually uh, gave, um, basically they signed Nuremberg having aggression at the center. Uh, they didn't mind by the, for the fact that aggression was not defined in the charter at all. So we didn't have, but still, they didn't consider it to be an issue when it came to prosecute the Nazis. Um, and most importantly, and very curiously, back in London, the US representative uh, Robert Jackson had submitted a definition of aggression that was not embraced in the end by the other uh, lead powers. Uh, which was, uh, and this is what I highlight in my book, basically uh, uh, very, very similar, if not uh, almost identical, to the one provided and contained in the resolution adopted in 1974, many decades after. So it, I found it always quite um, uh, intriguing that uh, then in 2010 in Kampala, so for a long time, the U.S. Had, cl had claimed that it was impo even impossible to define aggression and then therefore you, we couldn't have any international criminal court or if we had one, as this was the position in Rome, then the crime of aggression should not be included because it was impossible to define it. And then when finally states agreed on a definition, they said this is just a treaty definition can and it's actually very different from the customary one, but actually um, it was uh, basically uh, very similar to what they had submitted back in 1945. Um, so after Kampala, the US, um, so they were against the adoption of a definition in Kampala and when uh, after Kampala, the US started to um, basically um, call upon states not to ratify the amendment adopted in Kampala. Um, why this? Uh, why so? Basically, in um, Kampala, uh, along with the Article 8b, states parties adopted Article 15b, and um, um, according to this article, um, the court could have jurisdiction over aggression only when uh, at least 30, one year after at least 30 states have um, ratified the statute and only when the Assembly of States parties would have uh, adopted a decision in this respect. This happened, so the 30 of states to ratify the statute was uh, Palestine in June 2016 and in uh, December 2017 states and um, parties to the Rome statute uh, um, decided to activate the court jurisdiction from July 2018. Um, these are currently the 41 states that have ratified the statute. You will see why states have been quite um, disappointed. Scholars, most of the scholars are quite disappointed by what um, basically Kampala and the promise of Kampala has, has turned out, because these are all um, states that are not um, particularly relevant as uh, military powers and that historically or um, um, nowadays are more likely to be the victims of, of an aggression rather than the ones committing an act of aggression. Mm -hmm. Still, um, basically up until the decision to, to activate the court jurisdiction from Kampala 2010 to 
um, the December 2017, the U.S. Um, position was the one basically um, to, was saying that uh, discouraging even pu in public and uh, quite openly states from ratifying the state uh, the amendment. Um, Looking back at Kampala, um, the U.S., as I said, participated as uh, observers of observing states and they were quite um, proactive. Uh, once back home, they celebrated Kampala as a diplomatic success for the United States. Why so? They um, submitted in Kampala a list of understandings that were in the end uh, adopted uh, together with the definition by the state's parties, although with very significant changes in wording. These understandings, the, the, the diplomatic aims behind these understandings uh, was to, were twofold, basically. On the one hand, they wanted to exclude from the scope of the campaign amendment um, the so-called gray areas of the use of balance. So, um, in particular, the case of a unilateral humanitarian intervention, so inter military intervention on humanitarian grounds without any prior and express UN Security Council authorization, and um, the basically uh, use of force grounded on self-defense as it has been interpreted and implemented by the US in their war on terror. So um, basically a war with no uh, limits when it comes to time and space, um, and of course a war uh, fought against non-state actors and, and uh, both uh, with, as a response to an attack uh, that uh, occurred 20 years ago now, and at the same time as a um, way of preventing the future attack, threats of attacks, actually not even attacks, but threats of an attack. Um, now, they celebrated the adoption of the, um, the understanding as a success, so they basically claimed that this aim was uh, achieved. But if you look at the wording of the Kampala Amendment and the understanding adopted, there is nothing there that expressly excludes these cases from the scope of the crime of aggression. So one may wonder whether this uh, might be uh, deemed to have happened implicitly. And of course, and this is where it, the Kampala um, definition um, in paragraph one, the, thresh, the so-called threshold clause, uh, it becomes relevant for the purposes of our discussion today. Uh, one should look at the paragraph one <clears throat> of the Article 8 this and see, therefore, that an act of aggression should constitute a manifest violation of the Charter by its character, gravity, and scale. And this should be read together with the, an understanding adopted in Kampala, saying, Understanding 7, that no one component can be significant enough to satisfy the manifest standard by itself. So this has been, basically all scholars um, agree that this means that the three components altogether should be um, of such a gra gravity and the violation should be met basically for the manifest evaluation to, to, to actually be met as a standard. I, the, in my book, I actually disagree because, of course, the fact that there is express reference to no one component implies that actually two of them could be enough. The character of the evaluation then becomes fundamental. And in this respect, to basically to have a, to analyze the character of the military intervention and the legality of it, therefore, it is important to have a look at the main, the most relevant provision in this sense that are the ones contained in the UN Charter and the way the UN Charter has been then um, interpreted by the relevant international tribunals, in particular the International Court of Justice and the state practice uh, suggests that nothing, uh, not even under customary international law, has happened um, to conclude that actually unilateral humanitarian interventions are nowadays excluded from the scope of the crime of aggression, for instance. So, uh, and the subsequent practice of the US in this respect confirms that uh, they were still quite concerned 
they didn't want the, com the Kampala amendment to enter into force. If this was only a treaty crime, and they were actually states, not parties to the state, and if, if this was, uh, uh, and it was clearly um, excluding the gray areas of the use of Bellum, then they wouldn't be concerned at all. The fact that they showed concern and they actually called states not to ratify it, basically ran counter the claim of uh, diplomatic success in Kampala. The other aim they wanted to achieve, uh, it's um, regarded basically the jurisdiction of the court. And this might be satisfied in the end, because already in Kampala, states parties decided that um, the court could not have jurisdiction over aggression committed by nationals of states not parties or in their territory. So. The U.S. nationals basically are uh, excluded uh, and spared by the um, jurisdiction of the court. Still, the concern of the U.S. of the Kampala regarded those states um, parties to the state because it was not clear whether once the amendment to, uh, entered into force, this could uh, basically be relevant to all states parties or only to those uh, that have um, that ratified the state. Um, and of course, the main concern in this respect was for with regards to the UK. The UK is the main military, uh, one of the main military allies of the US, and they were our party, actually, to the state. Um, and the US uh, administration openly declared that this might be an issue because this might deter basically of the military, traditional military halid from in, intervening on the side of the US in, in future conflict. Um, but in December 2017, uh, when the Assembly of States parties activated the actual court jurisdiction of, on aggression, they clarified that um, this uh, should only regard those states parties that decide also to ratify the status. So, uh, at the moment, British uh, nationals and aggression committed on the British soil are excluded from the court jurisdiction. Um, still, the last point I want to make is that um, the, the Kampala could still represent a, a concern for the US, uh, no matter the jurisdictional restrictions uh, of the, and no matter the adoption of the understandings. Why? Because uh, basically, uh, there's nothing preventing the definition containing Kampala from being, from generating or crystallizing um, a, a, a corresponding norm of customary international law. And there is nothing preventing national authorities exercising jurisdiction over international crimes, including the crime of aggression, to exercise their universal jurisdiction or passive jurisdiction when, it, when and basically on the grounds of a national legislation defining the crime exactly as the same way it, it has been defined in Kampala. So take in, there's nothing preventing a national authorities to take um, the Kampala amendment as a point of reference for the national proceedings. In this sense, former um, U.S. leaders might not be spared from these national proceedings. What now? And I conclude here. Um, and we, we have seen with Biden, um, we are back to multilateralism instead of bilateralism. We have seen the termination of the sanctions against the ICC personnel. We ma they might also decide to join again the meetings of the ICC Assembly of States parties as observing states or even adopting future in the future um, UN Security Council resolution, voting in favor of UN uh, Security Council resolution referring possible situation before the ICC. But still, um, it's not likely that the Biden administration will join the ICC anytime soon. And uh, I can foresee that they will, in any case, because of the reason given with respect to the universal jurisdiction and possible implication for customer international law, they might keep discouraging states from um, basically ratifying uh, the state. Thank you for your attention. All that I just said and more, it's contained in my book. You 
if you are interested, you could buy it on the website of my publisher. And if you insert this uh, code, you will get a 30% discount if you buy it by the end of the month. Thank you very much. I'm happy to get any uh, question you might have. <laughs> uh, Julia, thank you very much indeed. Um, I think at this point we have about 20 minutes for questions. Um, if you have any questions, you can either use the raise hand function and we'll try to get you up. Um, alternatively, uh, you can enter them into the chat uh, function. So if you go to the lower right hand side of the screen uh, and click those uh, arrows in the purple box and then it's the icon uh, on the lower left hand side of the screen looks a little bit like a balloon. Uh, you can enter any questions you have into the uh, into that box. Uh, so first while we're waiting, just a couple of uh, comments. I mean, for one thing, uh, that sort of struck me very much by your presentation. Uh, you know, when you go back into the history of the definition of the crime of aggression, as you say, you know, how much has actually changed since was it 1944, 1945? And you know, I'm sort of fairly vaguely familiar with, uh, I believe it was the work of is it Benjamin Ferenc. Um, who, uh, or I can't remember if he's the father or the son, who was very much involved in that um, discussion about the definition of the crime of aggression. But, I mean, you know, the amount of diplomacy uh, and the amount, uh, you know, that has occurred over the course of what, 70 years or something like this, just to get to a definition that's more or less uh, stayed the same, I think is quite extraordinary. But I think more generally, what, what, what your presentation has also brought out are all the various legal maneuverings that have been uh, that the U.S. in this case has undertaken to try to push um, the ICC role in a certain uh, in a certain direction, at least to absolve itself of uh, any potential risk involved. Uh, sorry, absolve of any risk of, of actually getting called out uh, on the crime of aggression. But sort of the question I have for you is. You know, I mean, you started, you know, I think probably as early as the earliest you go in your presentation is around 1945, but I'm, I'm sort of more generally curious about this U.S. hostility to the International Criminal Court, perhaps to any sort of international control over its actions, wanting to maintain a great deal of flexibility, especially when it comes to their own military personnel uh, potentially being prosecuted, much less their leaders being prosecuted. And I'm wondering, you know, because your book, in your book, you go back to 1776, you know, is there something about U.S. political and legal culture, perhaps, you know, American exceptionalism that um, is sort of a thread that runs all the way through back from the beginnings through to the present day that's more or less responsible uh, or shapes the U.S. approaches to this issue? Um. Well, the U.S. have been historically in favor of a definition and then basically of, of aggression as a crime only um, for a few years from January 1945 actually till um, basically 1952 as I uh, put it, I, I, I'm highlighting in my book. So it's just a few years and um, they set an important precedent, the ones we all refer on to, the Nuremberg ones, and uh, um, they contributed very much in, during those years to the development of international law. But I, 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 I'd love to actually quote him uh, uh, words by words. I cannot at the moment, but uh, what uh, it was interesting was that basically right after I, I went back to some exchange of letters in between um, Robert Jackson and Truman right after actually the Nuremberg judgment came out and uh, the, the Jackson highlighted uh, to the president we set a precedent that we should be able to honor with regards to our nationals as well, well in, in the future. future. Um, still uh, of course this has never happened. So uh, I, before Nuremberg, they never, never, never claimed that aggression could be a crime as such. So there, of course, this wouldn't be relevant for the purposes of your question, because this was not considered a crime for, for anyone, not only for yeah. their own uh, 
uh, nationals. During the, 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 those years of Nuremberg, they agreed that, um, to be honest, uh, and this was also a request coming from the Russian, uh, not to prosecute any crimes committed by their own personnel, <laughs> and so to focus on the Nazis' crimes, basically. And, um, and but they, they believe that aggression actually could be considered a crime. And they also argued that uh, basically the main defense, as you might know, of the Nazis, uh, the defendants in Nuremberg was that uh, the principle of legality was uh, violated because they did, weren't even aware that the aggression was a crime before the, the, the war, the Second World War started up because they said nobody told us that actually not not that aggression could be um, a, a violation of the treaties that were adopted by that time could basically bring to the in individual criminal responsibility so that it was a crime and um, they actually argued that somehow and this was also embraced by the tribunal in the end uh, in its uh, final judgment um, aggression was already a crime uh, thanks to the adoption of all the pacts, including the Kellogg-Briand Pact, adopted in between the two wars, basically. So, but besides that moment, um, they were always against the, the, the even the definition, so the, the, basically the criminality of aggression, they had actually even the establishment of an international criminal court for a long time, because they, from 1952 on, up until Rome, they argued that it was better not to have any international criminal court at all if uh, aggression was included because aggression could not be defined. So it's not that they, their concern regarding their nationals and aggression actually started with uh, Rome, so with the establishment of the international criminal court, not before that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I've just, I was told uh, a minute ago that um, uh, we've activated everybody's microphones, should anybody else have a question. Uh, if I could just sort of ask one quick one for you, and hopefully uh, we'll get some questions from the other participants. Um, can you go back for a minute to the First World War, because we talked a bit yesterday about um, this book, The Trial of the Kaiser, and I was wondering if you, if you could sort of just give a bit of background uh, in terms of what the U.S. position was, uh, sort of, you know, this is again before Kellogg Briand, but what was the U.S. position about trying to prosecute for a, a essentially a crime of aggression, even if it wasn't necessarily defined as such at the time? Yeah, and indeed, this was uh, what I was referring to uh, previously. Um, in the aftermath of the First World War, you might know that basically there was an attempt to uh, establish an internet, the first international military tribunal, or to in any case try uh, the former Kaiser for um, the crimes committed in connection with the First World War, including uh, uh, um, uh, aggression, uh, although it was not defined uh, in, in by uh, the uh, Treaty of Versailles, Article 227, the very same way, but this is what they, uh, in the end, uh, came out. But uh, there was a discussion uh, in Paris, basically, and um, among different uh, allied powers, and uh, it was uh, the U.S. position that uh, aggression could not be actually included, and so the Kaiser should not be in any way uh, tried for aggression. Uh, uh, although they were in favor of individual criminal responsibility, even for heads of state and for, uh, in, in, of course, um, in office uh, at the, the, um, during the war. Um, so they were in favor of uh, the lack of any immunities when it comes to international crimes in the, and the very individual criminal responsibilities for violation come of laws come arising and stemming from not from the US or national jurisdiction, but from international law at the time was quite revolutionary as an idea. But still they uh, said, well, look, we agree, but aggression cannot be uh, at the center, it cannot be even a crime, or an offense actually, that the future tribunal to be established could be actually 
um, have jurisdiction over basically. So yeah, they they were against the criminality of aggression. So aggression was still a del an international delict, they call it like this, uh, but not a crime. So it, it could be seen uh, in, under certain circumstances as a violation of the ter certain rules, especially if regarded with, um, you know, in connection with certain principles like the sanctity of uh, the, the treaties, but uh, not um, from that violation, you cannot derive any criminal responsibility. By answered. <laughs> Any questions from the audience? Uh, so I'll just perhaps read out the question. Uh, so um, from uh, Jacob Flanders, he says, uh, my understanding from one part of your talk is that the crime of aggression is at odds with humanitarian intervention, uh, right to protect, etc. Though it was never fulfilled, wouldn't the mandate of the military staff committee in the UN Charter contradict the interpretation that no aggression is acceptable? An international force would seem to violate the law as it is presented here. Um, I, I believe there is a, um, there might be a misunderstanding. Uh, the responsibility to protect and humanitarian intervention as such are not at all at all. At all. Actually, the responsibility to protect is a doctrine that has been conceived by the Secretary of State of the UN and uh, the General Assembly has adopted a relevant dogma in respect. So it's very much actually in line with the UN principle, UN Charter principles. What I'm, I was referring to was the unilateral humanitarian intervention. So those military interventions fought because the, there is a claim that uh, genocide is ongoing and this should be stopped or prevented because uh, there is a threat that this could happen quite soon, a risk that this could happen quite soon. And the fact that uh, even um, an important power like the US or a, an important um, uh, military alliance like NATO, they still need an authorization according to the UN Charter of the uh, UN Security Council to use force. So I was referring basically to the um, presidents of Kosovo, for, for instance. So um, a military intervention uh, with the support or guided by NATO, which is an international organization, but with no prior uh, express authorization uh, by the UN Security Council. So according to the UN Charter, in the Article 39, the Security Council is the one determining the existence of, a, you know, of a, basically a, a threat to the peace, a breach of the peace, uh, or a threat to the peace, or an act of aggression. And uh, when facing an act of aggression, then they can authorize the use of military or non-military force. And um, and of course, uh, this means that. Uh, Basically, the mass violation, mass atrocities, or mass violation of human rights may be seen, uh, perfectly seen, as a threat to the peace, international peace and security under Article 39. And therefore, it is perfectly fine that if a ultima ratio, the UN Security Council decides to authorize the use of force uh, because of um, basically that determination under Article 39. What it is not fine is that a state or a group of states or an international regional organization might just decide to go and um, start an armed conflict without the permission of uh, the UN Security Council. Uh, we've also just had a question from uh, Sandra Wong. I'll just read that. Um, she asks, in your opinion, how has the relation between the US and the ICC affected the perception of the United States uh, internationally. Uh, the US has used respect for human rights and democracy as part of its foreign policy. Would the US behavior towards the ICC be a contradiction to this or not, in your opinion? Of course it is. Um, and it is. Uh, it has been, uh, to be honest, uh, the response of the in, in international civil society and scholars and also practitioners worldwide to the sanctions uh, imposed against the ICC personnel has been quite uh, something, a huge one, a con compact and consistent one. 
and uh, and so was the disdain facing such um, uh, <laughs> economic sanctions. But at the same time, one of my main points, unfortunately, is that um, so this uh, aggressive policy uh, that, of course, uh, basically um, with Trump we had a a point of uh, a low point of no return in this risk for internet for the international legal orders and in the international rule of law at least but uh, the us has been quite consistent so they have been very much historically in favor of ad hoc tribunals the establishing of a of ad hoc tribunals and this is the main points what they basically what they keep repeating. So we are very much in favor of international justice because we were behind the establishment of the UN tribunals in Rwanda, in, in the Balkans, in the former Yugoslavia, of course in Nuremberg, and we support all the others um, ad hoc tribunals. We will be very much in favor of an ad hoc uh, tribunal in Syria, for instance. But the ad hoc tribunals have a peculiarity, they are ad hoc. So they only concern a specific geographic situation, uh, at times uh, limited uh, in time. Um, and of course, uh, this might imply that the, 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 there is no implication for the US uh, nationals as such. When it comes to the International Criminal Court, for its very nature, the, the fact that it is permanent, the fact that it is uh, actually aimed at achieving a universality among its states' parties, the values behind it that might contribute to the development of customer international law, and the particular rules when it comes to the ratione persona jurisdiction, that I referred to at the beginning of my presentation, all these factors together with the prosecutor, this independent prosecutor that might overrun the US constitution and so on, these are all factors that are intrinsic as such. So they have been consistently an issue since Clinton uh, up until Biden basically. And they, I, I presume they will still be an issue for the future administrations too. Uh, a question from Audrey Rivera. Um, he was wondering, could a massive cyber attack against key infrastructure fall within the Kampala's definition of crime of aggression? It depends. <laughs> um, weirdly enough, um, many scholars uh, consider that uh, cyber attacks are not actually included in the, this more traditional definition. I mean, in the end, they copied and pasted most of, they referred to the Kampala, the Nuremberg presidents with the formula of, you know, the planning, preparation, initiation and execution, so something going back to 1945. And uh, they also included a definition actually drafted in, back in 1974. Uh, so nothing particularly new, but uh, there's a um, formula saying, or in any other ways inconsistent with the UN Charter. So. Uh, many scholars say that uh, com the Kampala Agreement sh amendment should not cover uh, cyber attacks. I must say that um, it might depend on the I ICC practice and, of course, on the attacks as such. What is, uh, however, quite interesting and I highlighted it in a section of my book is the US position on this because um, basically they, they argue that they could use force as a legitimate ground of self-defense as a response to a cyber attack and of a certain scale of course and this of course means that um, the force used in this respect to reply to respond to the army the, to the attack cyber attack uh, could not be relevant for the purposes of the campaign amendment but that the attack in itself could be equated and equivalent to a cinetic armed attack, so um, a tra the traditional, more traditional use of force. Um, so quite an interesting, uh, uh, in, they might be uh, unintentionally contribute to new developments of the use of force. I hope I answered and, and Adria. Uh, could I just chime in with one question? I noticed on your list of, I think it was 41 countries uh, that had signed up and ratified uh, the um, uh, was it the Kampala uh, uh, amendment amendments. Um, that among those were Spain, Belgium, Poland. So you have several NATO members 
who had actually signed up. I was curious if you saw any evidence that the U.S. had been pressuring allies not to. Um, no, no, yes, it's, 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 this was yes. the main point. Not in Spain, I don't know. I actually didn't find it. Uh, I didn't look for it, to be honest. What I found were public uh, statements uh, on the occasion of actually international conference and meetings in which uh, U.S. representatives were calling upon states not to ratify the state. So, and they, they many believed that they were behind the U.K. pressure to insert such a formula in the definition to activate the, 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 the court jurisdiction back in December 2017 that actually uh, as I said, um, limited the scope of the court jurisdiction to those aggression committed by state parties that have also ratified the status. So, of course, it was a national interest for the British as well, but uh, many said that uh, the U.S. were not present in 2017 under Trump. They decided not to participate, but they had their own uh, um, interest uh, fought for by um, the British as well. So, well, if there are no more questions, um, and as it, it's now uh, just after 7 p.m., I'm afraid we will need to bring this session to a close. Uh, Dr. Pecorella, thank you so much for a superb presentation, which uh, I found extremely informative, and I'm, I'm <laughs> certain you've definitely given all of us a lot to uh, take away from your talk and to think about. Um, before leaving, I would like to briefly remind you, uh, remind everyone that uh, the next session in the series will be on uh, next Tuesday when Dr. Andrew Gothorp of the University of Leiden will be speaking about um, uh, continuity and change in U.S. foreign policy from Trump to Biden in the broader context of the so-called imperial presidency. We heard a bit about uh, the continuity issue today and we'll be hearing a bit more about it next week as well and it's a more general uh, theme. Uh, but I hope you can join us for that. So I look forward to seeing you then and wishing all of you a very pleasant remainder of the evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Bye. Thank you, Julia.